By simultaneously optimizing biomarkers of multiple organ systems, can we maximize health and slow aging? So with that in mind, in today's video, we're going to go through a longitudinal biomarker assessment for creatinine. Now, creatinine is used to estimate the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, which is a measure of kidney function. And we can see that more specifically represented there, glomerular filtration being a marker of renal or kidney function. More specifically, the GFR is used to estimate stages of CKD or chronic kidney disease. So when there is no CKD or slight stage one, eGFR is greater than 90. And then as kidneys approach failure, stage five CKD, eGFR is less than 15. All right, so with that in mind, let's jump into the longitudinal biomarker assessment and see how creatinine changes during aging. So here we've got serum levels of creatinine on the y-axis plotted against age, and this is somewhere around 20 to 90 years old. And there we can see a significant positive correlation for creatinine levels versus age in this study of about 6,000 people. More specifically, creatinine increases during aging. Now, the reference range, and this is Quest Lab's reference range, is 0.6 to 1.29 milligrams per deciliter for creatinine. And if we only focused on the reference range, we would miss creatinine's age-related increase until about 80 years. So we can see that graphically represented here by putting up the reference range 0.6 to 1.29 as the black lines. And we, with the exception of a small amount of time in the early 20s, we can see that for most of the lifespan from 25 to 80 years, uh, creatinine is within Quest's reference range until about 80, and then creatinine levels would be a bit higher than the reference range. Now, as I mentioned earlier, creatinine is used to derive the EGFR as a measure of kidney function. So how does creatinine-derived EGFR change during aging? And we can see that here. So GFR estimate on the y-axis, so EGFR plotted against age. And in this study, it's a little bit younger than 20, up to 95 years. So EGFR declines during aging from values of about 125 in young adults. So lower creatinine in young adults would be uh, indicative of a higher EGFR, so better kidney function. And then uh, in older adults, relatively higher creatinine uh, would be indicative of lower uh, a lower EGFR or worse kidney function. So how is creatinine de derived EGFR related to all-cause mortality risk? And we can see that data here. This is a meta-analysis of 46 studies that included more than 2 million people. So we've got the adjusted HR or hazard ratio on the y-axis. This is the uh, all-cause mortality risk plotted against EGFR on the X. And first, we're going to start with data in people younger than 65 years old. So we put up a line at the hazard ratio of 1. And then the shaded region, or the 95% confidence interval, when that's completely above or below a hazard ratio of 1, we have a statistically significant association. So when compared with the referent, which was uh, identified or delineated as 95, an EGFR of 95, we can see that having relatively higher EGFRs, first for men in red, and then second for women in black, for people that were younger than uh, 65, had a significantly reduced all-cause mortality risk when compared with the referent of 95. So from this, we can see that if for people younger than 65 years of age, having a, a, an EGFR greater than 95 was associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So what about increased all-cause mortality risk? First in men, when EGFR was 85 to 95 and less than 70, as you can see the, with the red uh, lines, there was a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk in men. And then for women, when EGFR was less than 95, there was also a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk uh, when compared with 95. So what about, uh, what about all-cause mortality data in people that were older than 65 years? And we can see that here. So again, when compared with the referent, which was an EGFR of 95, we can see that lowest all-cause mortality risk in men was an EGFR in the 65 to 115 range. And note that the shaded red region uh, within that range, 65 to 115, completely overlaps with one. So that's not significantly different when compared with the referent of an EGFR of 95. For women, uh, when EGFR was in the 75 to 118 range, that was also not significantly different with 95. So uh, that would be the range for both men and women that's associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So what about increased all-cause mortality risk? First in men, when EGFR was greater than 115 and less than 65, there was a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk for people that were older than 65. And in women, when EGFR was greater than 118 and less than 75 or less than 75, also an increased all-cause mortality risk. 
So what's consistent for people that are older than 65 was that there was an increased all-cause mortality risk when EGFR was less than 65. So now, since we know how creatinine, EGFR, uh, and all-cause mortality risk uh, are, it, we, now that we've seen that data, we can uh, identify our longitudinal creatinine goals. So first, to avoid the age-related increase for creatinine and the decrease for EGFR, and second, to consistently keep EGFR greater than 95 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. So with that in mind, what's my data? So first, we're going to take a look at creatinine versus age from 2006 to 2022. And over that 17-year uh, span, I have 48 blood tests, as we can see there. And what we can also see is that there was a significant decrease for creatinine since 2006. As you can see, that's an inverse correlation. So as I've aged, my creatinine levels have declined, not increased, as expected based on the age-related trend. So in terms of the longitudinal creatinine goals, at least superficially, uh, it looks like I've, I've, I've avoided the age-related increase for creatinine. But note that uh, there's a little bit more to this data. So for the first eight measurements, this was before I started tracking diet. And for those who are unfamiliar with how I'm tracking diet and how that relates to my blood test data, I leave a video in the right corner. So check that out if you're interested. So for the first eight measurements on this plot, this was before diet tracking and my average creatinine was 1.12, resulting in an EGFR, an average EGFR of 86. But then in 2015, I started tracking diet every day. And uh, over those 40 tests since 2015, my average creatinine is uh, 0.95 milligrams per deciliter, resulting in an EGFR of 96. And both of those values are significantly better when compared with the first eight uh, data points before diet tracking. Which then raises the question, is the pre-tracking data driving the significance of this correlation? So with that in mind, let's take a look at creatinine versus age since the onset of diet tracking in 2015. And that's what we can see here. So this is the 40 blood tests since 2015 for creatinine versus age. And although that we, we can see that there's a positive correlation, so the little r, the correlation coefficient is positive, which suggests uh, uh, that as I've aged, creatinine has also increased, the p-value is not statistically significant. So there has been no significant age-related change for creatinine since I started tracking diet in 2015. So now we can return to the longitudinal creatinine goals and I can say with some more confidence that I've avoided the age-related increase for creatinine, so we give that a green check. What about consistently keeping EGFR greater than 95? So we're gonna see that here. So we're gonna see a plot of EGFR versus age over that same uh, eight-year period and 40 blood tests. And when we put up a line at, for 95 to delineate uh, EGFR being either higher than 95 or lower than 95, we can see just by looking at the dots, about half the dots are higher and about half the dots are lower. More specifically, my EGFR has been greater than 95 for 24 of the 40 tests. So 60% of the tests have had an EGFR higher than 95 since 2015. So now I can give a check because this for a majority of the tests, I had an EGFR that was higher than 95, which would be associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. But 60% could be better. So for that, I'll also give it a, a, a red X as there is room for improvement to more consistently keep EGFR higher than 95. So then the next question would be, how will I attempt to more consistently keep creatinine relatively low, thereby resulting in an EGFR greater than 95? Now, I mentioned earlier that I've been tracking diet since 2015, and because I've been doing that, we can address the question, which dietary components are significantly correlated with creatinine? So here we can see only the significant correlations for creatinine with uh, macros or micronutrients, and I've got them color-coded. So green and red are significantly correlated with lower and higher creatinine, respectively. So uh, more, uh, in other words, when the, the, the green stuff it's, a, it's an inverse correlation. So higher levels of the macro, macro or micronutrient, lower creatinine. And when it's red, when I've highlighted it as red, uh, higher levels of the nutrient, higher levels of creatinine. So what we can see on this chart is that at the top of the list is omega-3. So a relatively higher omega-3 intake is significantly correlated with lower creatinine in my data. And again, this is over the 40 blood tests since 2015. But it doesn't tell me omega-3 from what. So in 2018, I started, I started tracking individual food amounts. And uh, I wish I had the idea to track, uh, track individual food amounts sooner. Uh, but nonetheless, I have less data for individual food amounts in relation to blood test biomarkers when compared with macros and micros. But over 25 tests since 2018, when looking at my primary sources of omega-3, which are from flax seeds, walnuts, and sardines, 
as you can see by this mini graph, flax seeds may be driving the association for omega-3 with creatinine as flax seeds are significantly correlated with lower creatinine in my data. So when my flax seeds have been relatively higher, creatinine has been relatively lower. And you can see by the p-value that that's a significant correlation as it's less than 0.05. In contrast, walnuts and sardines are not significantly correlated with creatinine in my data over those 25 blood tests. So for the next blood test, which I should be taking in the next few weeks, blood test number seven in 2022, I'll increase flaxseed to test this hypothesis. And correspondingly, omega-3 intake will increase. And But will that impact creatinine? Now, note that a big part of my approach is not, is not to make one biomarker better and mess up the rest. I also want to make sure I've optimized all the other biomarkers while attempting to optimize one. So with that in mind, flaxies have a net correlative score of plus four, which means that they have uh, four biomarkers are going in the right direction relative to biomarkers going in the wrong direction. So, And that's in terms of aging and all-cause mortality risk. So increasing flaxine intake may improve creatinine without messing up other biomarkers. So uh, stay tuned for that data, and that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a bunch of discount links that you may be interested in, including epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee, and all of those links are in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.